So glad you joined us today for this message. It is a life-changing message, and as you hear it, we believe that you'll be eating from the banquet table of God. He invites you come and dine. The master call is come and dine. So Jesus has a word for you today, and we're thankful that you've plugged in to hear it with us. God bless you. I do want to introduce to you uh, Matt. So for some of you who don't know Matt, we actually, what, 18 months ago or so, we met, I can't remember. A lifetime. Seems like when I met him, he, he was like, my Lord, that's, that's uh, part of the family, the, the genetic clan of God. And so we felt like we knew each other immediately. We even met each other. We even started singing together immediately. Scared everybody around us. So, so this is about Matt. And, and I think I, I want you to know who he is and what he's done, where he's come from. But he's bringing us a word tonight. Matt Rogers is a TV show personality. NFL announcer and a business owner. He is the voice of the Tennessee Titans. Yeah, they I'm telling you, they tearing it up. Say they tearing it up. Go Titans. That's what I, I'm sorry, Titans. After becoming a Rose Bowl champion in 2001 with the, <laughs> she said miracle, with the Washington Huskies, yeah. Matt followed his passion into television. His first found fame as a season three finalist on Fox's reality singing competition, American Idol. Glory. Glory be to God. I got a song in my heart right now. I'm not sorry. I answered the master's call. Yeah, we, we, he and I are in singing competition. We do it. You'd be surprised. We do it in hotel lobbies. We do it in Starbucks. Oh, glory to God. Even at home. He has since gone on to host many television shows, including partnership with Discovery Channel, Hallmark, and NBC, and his wife, Terry, keeps everything going correctly. She actually is with child in her 23rd week. Number four. So they got Braden, 15, Mason, 13. Uh, Sam is seven. And we saw a picture of Sam today in the dentist chair. She was all laid out. I'm telling you, she, she was getting it done. But I just wanted to say, I, I really wanted to read that just so folks would get to know, Matt, who you are. But I just want to turn to how I know him spiritually. This is how I know Matt spiritually. In Colossians 2, 6, it says, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And I want to tell you, I've been with Matt. Matter of fact, this Damon and I were down with him. with uh, doing. Uh, he was doing something with the Buccaneers. Is that what you call them, the Buccaneers, Tampa Bay Buc Buccaneers? Or the Super Bowl champs, either one you want to say. And he was doing something down there with them, and he invited Damon. And I said, well, I'll drive Damon. He didn't even invite me. He had invited Damon, actually. I said, well, can I go? So he went down there, and he did a great job down there doing that with them. But that's part of what he does, too. He goes all over the nation doing things like that. But you, you closed my book for some reason. You want me to hush or what, what you doing? Okay. No. That's how she says I thought you was through. That means, hey. So, here's what I, what I wanted to say about, about you, Matt. Because the fir first moment we met you, we felt a kindred spirit, you know. And it's not because you and I are just vocal and happy, I don't think, or full of joy. It's just, it's just what, what we feel. And, and Jackie and I consider you part of the family. Our family considers you part of the family. You, you, uh, we, uh, we can't hardly wait to get Braden and Mace down here and Sam and, and Terry and have some fun with all of them again. But I want to say this about you. Everyone, everywhere, every time that I'm with you, without, you know what every means? Without exception. I've been with a lot of folks around a lot of places, but without exception, you never quit believing in somebody around you. We, we stopped at this place on the way home. He had six people around him doing a thing with him like this and they're like and so the lady came, the lady came by me that was up there it's like in a, a, a restaurant or something, and she says are, are you with are you with she was I stand up she said are, are you with Matt Rogers I said no ma'am she said oh I'm sorry I said no Matt Rogers is with me <laughs> there's a big difference <laughs> he's riding in my car my gate so anyhow, with that said, what I found with Matt is a deep, deep commitment and love of Jesus Christ and wanting to see 
the kingdom of God, no matter where he's at, if he's, if he's announcing up in that uh, stadium in uh, Nissan Stadium, is what it's called? In Nashville, or whether he's with the Buccaneers down there, you know, it's always to see, he always is always giving glory to God. He doesn't open his Bible always and preach, but he's always, they know where he is, know where he's from, and know where he's headed. So, why don't you say something about Matt? Uh, what I love is, you know, you can live, but the Lord says, what mainly he loves is when we walk in him. You know, we can say, you know, I love you, Lord. I, I, I'm yours. But the proof is in the pudding in your walk. When you're walking, wherever the Lord's, and what I love, he says, wherever you put your foot, you're claiming it for the kingdom of God in advancement. And that's what Gregory and I have set back and saw in Matt's life is that what doors that God is opening of influence, it's because God knows and trusts the Jesus of Matt that it's not about Matt, but it's about Jesus that lives in him. So he's walking saying, I claim it for the kingdom. I claim this for Jesus. I'm, I'm doing this for the Lord. And that is what is exciting for all of our lives, that whatever we do in word and deed, we do it what? hardly unto the Lord. So open your heart because he has a word from heaven, and you will see how much he loves the Lord and the minister of the gospel he is. So come on up. Y'all welcome. Woo. And let's just pray over him real quick. Amen. Woo. Okay, my arm is caught in there. Okay. You're in between some good guys here. Go ahead. Yes. Amen. Father God, I thank you that we can come boldly before the throne of grace in the mercy seat where the blood of Jesus is speaking tonight. That blood speaks, and it speaks loudly. It speaks salvation, redemption, healing, deliverance, restoration is in this house by the Holy Ghost and by the blood of Jesus. I thank you as mad as he opens his mouth, he will declare the goodness of God. And I thank you, Lord, we are good, good ground. Because, Lord, you're going to do miracles in our lives tonight. Yeah. Revelation will be floating to everyone that's sitting in seats. Those that are listening online, I declare revelation knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. Revelation means that we don't just hear it in its knowledge. Revelation means we hear it and we start walking in it. And I thank you for the, our lives that we let Jesus walk and love big in us. Thank you for Matt. Thank you for the words he's going to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You are all dismissed. Have a fantastic night. That was great. Could we give it up for our pastors? Oh, come on. Y'all can do better now. Can you give it up for your pastors? Like, they don't mess around. I love you guys so much. I love you guys so much. Uh, it's funny to hear Allison when, when, when Mama said, I want a Rose Bowl, and she said that was a miracle in itself. Like, you guys don't really know what I was and what I am. Like, from a football standpoint, I was the short, fat, chubby, slow guy. I played one play my freshman year. I quit my sophomore year, and the freshman coach basically gave a speech to everybody after we had finished our last game and literally said something along the lines of, most of you will probably never go to play college football, and probably none of you will go on to play professional football, especially Rodgers, because he bleeping sucks. He said that in front of all of the freshman kids. So, like any other freshman, I quit. I quit, and I didn't play my sophomore year. And then it took one coach, a praying mother behind the scenes that spoke life into me every single time, that it took one coach and I was playing in PE because back then, if you didn't compete in sports, you played in PE. And I was running around playing flag football because I always loved football. I just wasn't very good at it, but I loved it. And he looked at me and he goes, you have really good feet. And I was like, I have really good feet? You're right. I do have really good feet. And then I started developing that, and I believed in him, and then the rest is history. So the fact that you said that it's a miracle that I won a Super Bowl you are a Rose Bowl, you ain't teasing because uh, it is a miracle. How many people, all right, I'm going to go back. How many people love Pastor Gregory and Jackie? Family, y'all kind of don't count, 
because you're family. How many people who aren't family love your pastors? I love you guys. Like, we are all family. Preach, sister. I love you guys so much, and I'm going to talk about a little bit how, you know, we met and stuff down the road, but I will say this. Uh, when I'm with you, life is better, and that's why I'm here. I didn't even know I was preaching until about 48 hours ago, but uh, I came down here just because I wanted to be here with you guys. So one thing I hate, or I hated growing up, was when the pastor was on a series and then the guest speaker comes in and, like, goes in a completely different direction. So, like, pastor speaking about joy, and then this guy comes in and speaks about something completely left field. So, I'm going to honor the pastor, and I'm staying on joy. You can see behind me, y'all, does anyone need some supernatural joy in here? Are you ready? So, I'm only going to focus tonight on four verses. Philippians 10 through 13. You can turn there if you want. Don't worry about it. I'm going to read the first two verses. So this is Paul writing to the church from prison. So let's bring up Philippians 4, 10, if we could. So y'all could read this with me. This is Paul when he says, my heart overflows with joy when I think about how you've demonstrated your love to me. Let's go to uh, the end of that in verse 11. He says, I'm not telling you this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. Paul learned to be satisfied in any circumstance. Some of us need to learn how to be satisfied in any circumstance. And I'm going to preach that to you tonight because I'm a guy that has realized at an early age that joy isn't based on your circumstances. It's a spiritual reality independent of what happens to you. For you young people, I highly recommend if you have your cell phones in your hand, click off the Snapchat, click off the TikTok, click off the video games, slide the top right of your screen down and click the little half moon that says do not disturb for the next 30 minutes. And then go to your notes and start writing these notes because I'm going to bring something that y'all need to hear and it's going to be really, really good. Joy is based on spiritual realities and it's independent on what happens around you all right paul said that he was content regardless of what was going on around him content means pleased delighted or glad how could somebody in prison have joy and be content in a situation and be pleased delighted and glad when he's in a freaking prison how is that possible it's possible because paul had supernatural joy again paul wrote this in prison as he was being attacked, following God's mission. Some of us in here are doing exactly what God told us to do, but we're still going through hell. We're still being attacked. Doing the mission that God told us to do. That happened to me in 2008. So not only was it a miracle that I made the Rose Bowl, after that I tried out for a show called American Idol. Thanks for voting for Fantasia, by the way, Jeff. That was really hurtful that you voted for Fantasia over me, but I've gotten over it and we're BFFs now, okay? I was a finalist on American Idol, lost to Fantasia, but from there I got into hosting television shows because I had a desire in my heart, honestly, like I love to make people laugh. Like when he says that we go around like singing to people and stuff, like that is no joke. We really do and it completely brightens the place. But in 2006, my first son was born. I was hosting a television show called Really Big Things on Discovery Channel. It was like my first big break after American Idol. And the first season was a hit. Second season was a hit. Right as I signed my contract, stay with me, I'm 29 years old. I sign a $780,000 contract for four months of work. That's good money. That's, that's rich people money right there. That's rustling money. <laughs> I love what Papa said to Jackie two days ago. He said, we were around all these rich people in Tampa Bay that were supporting the Bucks. He goes, Jackie, them people didn't have rattling money. They had rustling money. <laughs> Only in Georgia. Between you and Uncle Jerry, I can't understand half the stuff you guys say, but I could feel it on you, and I love you. I love you, Uncle Jerry. But 
I had just signed my biggest, con- like, it, it, was, it was time. Like, I had arrived. I was walking in the will of God, faithful to my wife, awesome husband, awesome dad to my kids, honored God everywhere I went. I even tithed 10% of all my money. I was doing everything right. And I was praying, God, show me what you want me to do. Send me down the roads you want me to travel. Close the doors you don't want me to enter and bust open the ones you want me to bust through. And this one was served to me on a silver platter. I did everything right. I was carrying out the mission of God. And in 2006, my first son was born, Braden, he talked about. In 2008, my second son was born. And 30 days into his birth, my wife goes into the hospital, or the doctor's little one-month checkup. And that's when everything changed. That's when we got attacked and we were in our own personal prison, our own personal hell, when we got the call that our son was born and diagnosed with a rare genetic disease called cystic fibrosis. And the doctor said, there's currently no cure. And I remember pulling over on the side of the road, bawling my eyes out. And I said, is my son gonna die? And the doctor didn't answer me. And you know when the doctor doesn't answer you, when you answer, ask those questions, that's really, really not good. I said, well, let me talk to my wife. He goes, your wife can't talk right now. I said, what is she doing? He said, she's crying in the corner. That, for us, was hands down the worst time of our life. Uh, two years before that, we're standing at the altar. We're young and we're in love. Through richer, through poorer, sickness and in health. Good times and bad. And in 24 short months, we went from richer to poor. And we went from happiness to sorrow. And I literally remember holding my son up to God, bawling my eyes out. Almost kind of like for those of you who watch Lion King when he holds up like Simba. I remember doing that and bawling my eyes out and asking God questions, real questions. Why did you die on a cross for my kid's sickness only to have my kid sick? Why did you die on a cross, and why, by your stripes, my son is healed, even though he just got this diagnosis? Why did you die for our pain and our anguish and our anxiety, only to have a wife sitting in a corner in fetal position, depressed, not going out of the house for nine months? Where are you? Where, what, what happened? Like, I was literally, I did everything right, and I was walking through hell. I watched what uh, Papa Pope did a couple weeks ago when he was talking about joy, and he had a handful of you come up here and hold some things. It was really cool. He had some grits, because y'all are Southern. He had like some oil and a towel, and one of the guys that was holding the grits, it got so heavy, he couldn't, he couldn't hold it anymore. And Papa came over, and he invited everybody to lay what they were carrying down at the altar. And I thought there was something so powerful and supernatural about that. And I wrote down, God will take what you're carrying and what you've been carrying and he'll turn something good out of it. That's why he had you lay that down at the altar. And I wanna tell you guys right now, what, no matter what your opposition that you're facing, God's power is bigger than any challenge that you're facing. And for you younger people, here's what you need to know. I'm speaking specifically to you. Older people, this could trickle over on you as well. Are there any younger people over here? Yes, I got one one right here. There we go. One in the back. There you go, sister. But here's what I wanted to say. When you're going through that, the number one thing that Satan tried to attack was my mind. The number one thing. And I started looking at people who weren't Christians that were getting on boats and going to the river and celebrating with their healthy kids and having a good life. And it started to make me bitter at God because I'm like, I'm doing everything right. They're doing everything wrong. Why are they getting the blessing and I'm not? Why is his wife all happy? I know the stuff that she does. I know the people that she's been with. My wife's sitting in fetal fetal position and depressed. Why is that? The, The devil will try to attack your mind And the number one thing he's going to try to get you to do is stop believing the words of Jesus. If he can get you to question that and do that, and he could raise a little bit of doubt, that's where he's attacking. The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge, not because of the will of God. So we need to get the knowledge to stop the destruction. If the devil can plant a seed in your mind, he's got you. Which is why we need to renew our mind on the word. 
I remember going back home after that, and I can't talk about it too much because I'll cry, but I just remember that life will never, ever, ever be the same. I had this promise from God, but I had this very real problem, and it kept me totally dependent on God, and I had one of two choices. I could become bitter at God and start looking for joy outside of my home and in other places, or I could stand on a promise that I couldn't see, but I could trust for it to come to fruition. And this is why I'm speaking to the young people right now, especially as you start to get older and get in relationships. Things are gonna come. If you don't know who you are, and this word is not ingrained in, inside of you, you'll start looking for joy in other places. It was very easy for a guy like me, celebrity, off of American Idol, on a Discovery Channel, to walk down the street to go into another place and get a lot of attention from a lot of other people. Really good looking people, really good looking women, especially when my wife's at home, probably hasn't put makeup on in about six months, doesn't stop crying, and just a burn to be around. Didn't really like going home. And I had a decision to make. And if you don't know who you are, and if you don't have your identity in Christ, what is going on out here will look like better joy than what God gave you in the first place. And the thing that you stood up at the altar and you prayed for and God finally gave you that person, you'll leave and go somebody, somewhere else. Know who you are. Joy is a mindset. You have to make up your mind that you are going to be joyful. One of my favorite presidents of all time said, people are as happy as they make up their minds to be. Who said it? Abraham Lincoln. That's right, Jeff. Our patriots are in the house, baby. People are only as happy as they make up their mind to be. Abraham Lincoln said that. Joy is a mindset, not a circumstance. The problem is we get so caught up in our circumstances that we're only as good as it's going. and you ebb and flow, and as long as the day's treating me good, then I'm joyful. But if things aren't going bad, man, it really stinks. We're just coming out of probably the worst 18 months of a lot of people in this place, and before I say this, I'm not saying this uh, out of anger or anything, I'm just being real identity. Joy is a mindset. We become laid off from our job, and we become the guy that's laid off. How you doing, brother? Well, I'm laid off. You know, I just, I don't know what, what God's doing. I just, you know, lay it off, please. Keep me in prayer, brother. Keep me in prayer. Instead of knowing and trusting that, look at if God closed that door, he's got a better door for me to run through. You know what I'm saying? How about when we go to church? Well, I just don't like going to that church. They're just not very loving people. Should have been. You were there. Come on. Are you loving Come on, Allie. You tell me, baby. When I first got the Titans job, I remember praying for God to give me that job, and it was awesome. I finally got the job. My very first uh, game was against the Bears this year, and the whole time I'm sitting there, and of course I was nervous, and I don't know, you never know who's going to watch down the road, especially when it's recording, but Lord, let the right people see this before I say this, because it's a good story. My boss was not very kind sitting in that booth so I'm sitting there doing my best watching everything and it was not a great experience because he's overseeing so many different people and it's like where's my line f this f that he's and I'm like oh my gosh and Rogers you're not supposed to do that Mama. and I was like holy smokes and I remember leaving kind of feeling like I did when I was a freshman and I honestly like I wanted to quit and I just remember saying God you brought me here for a reason. I know I'm not here to just be an announcer. Let me radiate you. I know things aren't going well, but God, let me experience your joy. Paul was in a prison, and he knew that things were going to get better because he knew the principles of God. So I was going through this. I knew things were going to get better for my kid, for my wife, in this job. And I'm telling you, the third game, this is so cool. Third game, we're sitting there, and it's, it was a nightmare. And he sits down and out of nowhere. He's going through everything. He goes, all right, let's get the lights up, music, DJ, hit the things. Rogers, what the F, blah, 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 blah. And he's saying all this stuff. And he goes, and Roger. And it was like he stopped. And he goes, he goes, you know what? 
I really should stop talking that way around you and, and treating you that way. I'm, I'm really sorry. I'm not going to do that anymore. I go, what? I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, I just know, you know, you're, you're kind of like a man of God. And uh, I just, I don't, you know, I, I just shouldn't be doing that. And I said, thank you. I really appreciate that. And things have changed ever since. My point is, quit praying for God to get you out of your job for that horrible boss and start bringing heaven and changing the environment. Greater is he that's in than you that's in the? Come on, I'm going to the young people. Come on, do you all know your Bible? Greater is he that is in? Then he that's in the, there you go. The girl in the green's got it, okay? She's a keeper. Gentlemen, keep your eye on her. That's going to be a good future, okay? I'm telling you, you got to know who you are. You got to know what this word says. Is anybody having a good time yet? Where are the happy people at? I like happy people. I like being around happy people. I want to touch on where me and my man Damon and Big Papa were. We just got done with a big event from the Bucks. I just gave you a couple situations when things weren't great. Let's flip it a little bit. Let's go when things are really, really good. We start to find our joy in how good it's going. So he saw me in action. He saw me in action. We have a really good time. We're around some really cool people. One of the coolest wrestlers, the big guy, Titus O'Neil. He was there. We were kicking it with Titus O'Neil. He's freaking cool, man. And you get off the stage, and Papa saw it firsthand, like, everybody loves you, and they give you attention, and you just raised a bunch of money for a really, really good cause, foster kids. It's all good. Everything's good. Like, I love it. But if my identity and my joy gets wrapped up in that, in the good stuff, well, the next morning when I wake up, it's not a very good day. Oh, well, you know. I'll go back to South Georgia. <laughs> Maybe if I'm lucky, I can go hog hunt with Uncle Jerry. But, I mean, you know, last night, I was, I was the guy. I was on stage. Everyone loved me. Your identity should never be in your circumstances. Your joy is not found in your circumstances. Your joy is a mindset and a decision that you make regardless of what is going on around you. Next point would be the purpose of joy. Ooh, this is going to be good. The purpose of joy is to not get something from, but to give something to. The purpose of joy is to not get something from, but to give joy to something to, or, or something to. Young people, in the Bible, it says, quit comparing yourselves amongst yourselves. Quit looking at people and what they have and wish that you were like them. And start looking at what you've already been accepted and what Christ already says about you. So now you can start loving people. I want to do something cool. I want you on the end. Second row. Yes, you. Come up here. It's going to be so fun. This is going to be so fun. Come up here. Who are you? I like them Crocs, gangster. There you go. What's your name? Nathan. Your friends call you Nate Dog? Nate D-O-double-G? Anyone ever tell you you smell good, bro? You smell like new car leather and expensive cologne. Are you rich? Well, you're going to be rich. All right. I want you to look at someone over here, one of the kids. Do you know every single kid over here or not? Do you know them in the corner? You do? Do you know, is there anyone in here that you don't know? Do you know that kid right there? With the Ghostbuster shirt on. Do you know him? You don't know him? Come up here for me real quick. Come on. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters. Here's what I want you to do. Start looking at him. And I want you to, even though you don't know them, I want you to find one thing that you really like about them, even though you don't know them. And when you have it, tell me. Okay, what's your name? Eli. What is it? Eli. Eli. Whoo, you're a prophet. Watch out. Come over here. All right, so this is Eli. This is Nate Dog. You got it yet? The one thing that you like about Eli, even though you've never met him. Okay, say it loud and proud. What is it? You like Eli's personality. Eli, give me some skin. He likes your personality. Give him a high five. That's all. All right? Go have a seat. Go have a seat. Here's my point. I'm teaching you something there. Nate Dog, I did that for you. Look how happy Eli is. He had no idea that was going to come on tonight. You're coming up here. About four or five of your friends started recording you. Tonight when you leave, 
This is, the, this is the whole point, the whole purpose. Tonight when you leave, that is gonna be the highlight of your night. What you just did for Eli is gonna be the highlight of your night because you just gave him something that he might not have ever gotten before in his life. Eli, how many people have told you in your life that they like your personality? Is that the first time you heard that? First time he's ever heard that, and that came from you, Nate. You know what you just did? You just gave him something instead of taking something from him. When Papa talks about us walking into Starbucks together, looking at what we can give, there are people everywhere dying for you to tell them something good about them. I like your shoes. I like your hair. You smell good. Those are cool glasses. Man, where'd you get that walker? That's actually a really cool walker. If I was in a walker, that'd be the walker that I would get. I, I pick one. Brighten somebody's day. Bring heaven everywhere you go. Look for places to give joy instead of receive it. Quit looking for joy outside instead of giving joy. When you give joy, it automatically comes to you. I'm going to challenge you young people, just what we did there. You want your life to change? You want your social life to change? You want it to be good at school? Let's go. Future bride right there in third row saying yes. I'm giving you the key. Look at I'm giving you the key. I'm telling you, this is it. And this works for adults too. Pick someone at school that you never talk to and just say hi to them and smile. Tell them they look good. That might be weird at your age. Tell them you like their sweater. I always tell this to my kids, like, Dad, that's freaking weird, dude. Stop. But my point is, if you go back to the Bible, the Bible says... Proverbs 17, a joyful mind brings healing. Could it be that if you don't have a mind that brings joy and healing to something, that you're going to continue to look to outside circumstances to get joy? Nate Dog, if you ever feel depressed, if you ever feel down, if you're not having a good day, do that, and your, your whole day will change. Give joy away, and your whole life will change. My boy Damon, I love you, bro. I love you, bro. You taught me something yesterday that's going to stay with me for my life. Without getting in too much detail, we're all going through something. I saw a challenge that you have been battling for years. And when we were driving home in the car, we started talking about how can we get this to change? you made a decision that you were gonna start speaking good things and looking for the good things in that instead of always, you know, well, well, this is bad, this is bad, look it. I'm telling you right now, y'all could look at me for the next 20 minutes and pick 20 things that are wrong with me. Or you could look at me for the next 20 minutes and pick the one thing that's right with me. You tell me that one thing that's right with me, it's gonna build me up and it's gonna make, and it's gonna make you feel better. And from you doing that, I watched you come home last night or even before we left, and you're having a conversation with that person, and he sounded like someone I've never heard of before. He was talking different because of the seed that you planted, the joy that you planted. You made a mindset and a decision, I'm gonna change this thing around. And when you came home from your basketball game last night, which by the way, you and Hunter got that dub, congratulations. I watched you change last night, and after you left the room, we all just looked at each other and smiled like, that's it, man. You got it. You chose joy. Joy is a choice. It's not based on your circumstances. You got to look for what you can give, not what you can get. Because if you're always looking for what you can get, it makes you weak, man. It makes you thirsty. What can I get? What can I get? I'm so thirsty. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give gimme, gimme, gimme. Well, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fulfill it uh, in, in this woman. Nah, that wasn't good enough. I'm going to go to the next one. Oh, that's not good enough. I'm going to go to this guy, this French. Oh, he looks cool. Oh, uh, no, that's not good enough. I'm going to try this job. No, that's not good enough. Football players. Oh, I'm going to transfer to this school. No, I didn't like the coach there. No, I'm going to go. No, I don't like that offense there. And you constantly are chasing, and you're so thirsty, and you start to live with a pushover spirit instead of a takeover spirit. You are designed to take things over, take territory in your schools, in your home, in your relationships, in your church. I wish I had Covenant Church in Tennessee. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? 
Y'all can change the world out of this building, but it's a mindset. It's a choice. How many people can you get in here next Sunday that need what's going to be spoken this Sunday? I think there's about 60 people in here right now. How easy would it be to invite one person? Eli, you got any friends in your neighborhood? Want to invite one friend on Sunday, okay? Just one. You got the name? You know who you're going to invite? Freaking love you, bro. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Eli is the first one. Nate Dog, who are you inviting? Someone in your neighborhood. I don't want to put you on the spot. All right? Everybody bring one on Sunday, and I promise you, you're going to watch things change. They need it here. You're going to feel so good when you bring somebody next uh, this Sunday because you're going to know that you changed their life. So you got to you know, what are you bringing joy to? Here, actually, I wrote down this way. Ask yourself this question real quick. Take a deep breath. Kids, if I lost you, get back off of the app. Come back to me. Ask yourself this question. What are you bringing joy to? And where can you bring more joy to? For me, I'm going to get real with you guys. I always get real with you. For me, it's my sons. Building my relationships with them. I got a 15-year-old and I got a 13-year-old. Both of them great kids, love the Lord, different problems. All right? 15-year-old, I'm going to have to... Uh, Preach to him the way I'm preaching to you guys. Spend some more time with him. Really educate him on where joy comes from. Because like any teenager, they're kind of only as good as how it's going. No one really said hi to me today. I don't think anyone really cares about me at school. Why do all the buttholes have all the friends and the girls and the nice guys finish last? You know what I'm saying? So for me, it's with my sons and show them. And then the other one, he's like the man. Like everyone's texting him on Friday around four o'clock, finding out what we're doing tonight. I mean, his Snapchat is going through the roof and he just picks and chooses which one he's gonna kick it with. And with him, kind of like the NFL event example, we gotta keep him on base that that's gonna change. And it's going to go like this. And once that gets quiet, are you really in right relationship with him to where you're drawing your joy from? Harvard did a study, and they said 10% of the happiest people among us had personal and purposeful relationships. I'm going to say that again. Harvard did a study, and it said the happiest people among us, not Christians, the happiest people among us, so non-believers, fall into this category as well. The happiest people among us had purposeful and meaningful relationships. Joy gets magnified on a relationship based on purpose. Your joy gets magnified on a relationship based on purpose. If your relationship with God is based off of what you can get from him, it'll never work. Because when you pray and something doesn't get answered, you're going to question why it didn't get answered, and you're going to question God and if he really loves you. Heaven's answer was Jesus. There'll never be another one. You don't pay such a high price for a piece of junk. He paid the ultimate price and laid his life down for you because he looked at you and said, that life with me inside of it is worth me dying for. I'm going to say that again. Jesus looked at you and said, that life with me inside of it is worth me dying for. Jesus died with you on his mind. And when you're not filled with him and his spirit, you're not walking the abundance that you could be walking to. You'll be walking a Christian tightrope and wondering if you're getting it right. I never, ever, ever grit my teeth to try and be a better person or try to be a Christian. I just am. I'm not bragging like I never screw up. I just, I'm just happy. It doesn't matter if we're going to Starbucks. It doesn't matter if we're going to church. It doesn't matter if I'm on a stage with NFL players. It doesn't matter. Show me one person that Jesus didn't pay a price for, and that'll give you an excuse to walk by them as if they don't matter. You can't find them. They're everywhere. They're everywhere. And what you just saw on stage is probably one of the best
best things you can do to get started on getting your joy back. You bosses out there, start saying good things about your employees. Watch how much harder they work for you. Quit telling them what they're doing wrong. Start telling them what you like about them and what they're doing right and work on that. And you'll watch your whole team, your sales, your culture, your environment go through the roof. They'll get there five minutes early instead of avoiding you five minutes late. Joy gets magnified on relationships based on purpose. Pastor Gregory asked me before we came here tonight when you and I were having lunch. I have so many good, just cool moments with you. I love you, Daddy. You asked me, <laughs> you said, why do you love me and my family so much? You said, why do you love us so much? And uh, I told him, let me get that. I told him a year ago when I came here and met him for the first time, when I got, I came here with uh, Rex and Kyle. And when I got in the car and I left, like, I started crying. Because I said I hadn't felt that in probably 20 plus years since my mom had passed away. And I felt, I felt it different. I felt the joy in them that came over to me and it made me overcome with joy and I got sad when I left. And that's why when you carry joy, when your life is about joy, despite your circumstances, you attract people like a magnet. They wanna be around you. For you kids, and there's at least one or two of you, for you kids that are struggling making friends at school, that are struggling to fit in, start getting a little bit outside of your comfort zone and giving joy away to people. It's so easy. And the cool people that you think have it all put together, trust me, no one's calling them and telling them how great they are. Just start telling them one little thing you like about them. And they might look at you really weird for the first couple days, but keep doing it. You will feel so good after you do it. When I'm in the presence of Papa Pope and Mama Jackie, their joy radiates over to me and I don't wanna leave, I wanna be around them. Which is why, like, look at man, I have a really cool family at home and we're getting ready to take the fifth wheel and go camping and last night we were at an awesome, or two nights ago we were at an awesome event, like, I could have flown back, I could go anywhere, I could do anything. Why would I wanna come to South Georgia? Why would I wanna come to Douglas, Georgia and Sit, honestly, because of them and because of you. Why well, don't I want to leave an NFL event to come here? Because I want to be with you. I want to be around what you have. It's unspeakable joy and love, and it's real, and it's authentic. These people don't need anything from you, and they don't need anything from your friends that you're going to bring on Sunday. They have something to give, and your people need what they have. So bring them to the house. The whole point of church is to come here so we can glean from each other and go out there and change things. I'm so tired of weak, broken down Christians with no power or joy. The world doesn't need another laid off, broke down Christian, another Christian that's struggling just to survive. You gotta get alone with the Lord, renew your mind, get inside of what this word says and start standing on the promises of joy that he's given you. These are yours for the taking. But back to what I said in the beginning, the biggest problem is based on our circumstances, he'll attack our mind and we'll start to not believe really what's in here because what I'm experiencing isn't really lining up with what this says. Paul was in a prison and he said, it doesn't matter what happens to me. I have unspeakable joy. Pastor Gregory and Mama, they live to give. If I was to put a banner on y'all's life, I would say, y'all live to give. And I wrote down, there's a link between your generosity and your joy. There is a link between your generosity and your joy. What y'all just saw right here he gave Eli something that he had never heard in his life, and that gave you joy. Watching him run all excited back to his parents. Did you hear what he said? I got a good personality. There's a link between your generosity and your joy. I did that for you, Nate Dog. not so much for Eli, but the blessing came upon him because you spoke it. Power of life and death is in your tongue. Speak wisely. 
A joyful mind brings healing. Going back to my personal story with my kids. Um, all this stuff preaches well. Get you all fired up and you say amens and I love all that. I, it's awesome. I don't have a problem with any of that. And when people win the Super Bowl or the World Series or the soccer championship and they get up there and they say, I want to thank my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't have a problem with that. But it didn't cost them anything. When you can stand at a funeral, someone that you've been praying for, or a child that you've been praying for for a miracle, and they pass away, and you don't understand it, and you can say, God, I don't understand what I'm going through, but you are still the Lord and Savior of my life. And I am not going to dictate my joy in your character and, na and, and nature based off of my circumstances. I'm going to go back to the word. I'm going to stand on the word. I'm going to stand on the promise, not my circumstances. I'm going to stand on the promise, not the way I feel. I'm going to stand on the promise, not my emotions and the things that I'm hearing in my head. Isn't it funny that the first thing that the devil ever did to Adam and Eve was say, did God really say that? That's the first thing he said. Did God really say that? I'm healed. I'm healed. Did God really tell you you're healed? Because you're still kind of walking with a limp. I'm healed. I'm healed. Are you really healed? Because you're still taking blood pressure medication. I'm healed. My son is healed. Is he really healed? Because you just gave him three breathing treatments and 13 medicines. That happened to me. I watched his weight go down. I watched his lung function go down. I watched my wife get more and more depressed. And I can get so caught up in that and start looking for joy outside of this because what I'm experiencing here is not matching up with here. So did God really say that? Did God really tell you to marry that person? Did God really tell you to take that job? Yes, stand on the promise and stand on the word. I remember doing breathing treatments, and this is where I'll wrap it up. As I would do breathing treatments, I remember sitting there holding my baby boy, wife, I've already said it three times, you know what she, you know, it wasn't good. And I remember thanking God for his healing, even though he wasn't healed. Some of people are battling a sickness. Maybe you're battling cancer. And by you praying for somebody and believing someone, uh, believing that someone that has cancer, believing that they're going to be healed while you're sick, it doesn't make you a hypocrite. It makes you a believer. As I was doing breathing treatments for my kid being sick, I saw so many other kids being healed. That is frustrating but I didn't look at the circumstance I went back to the word I would speak over my son the way Jesus saw him Jesus never saw him sick Jesus doesn't see you depressed Jesus doesn't see you addicted when you start looking at yourself through the lenses of Jesus everything changes regardless of what's going on around you I remember doing breathing treatments and speaking God I thank you for his healing he might be three years old right now, and he can't breathe really well, and he's not very big, but I thank you. I thank you that when he's five, he's going to get better. I thank you that when he's seven years old. I thank you that I'm a coach's baseball team. I thank you that I'm a coach's football team. Doctor, do you think he could play baseball, football? No, not really. All right, God, I thank you that he's going to. And I kept speaking life over him, and I kept believing life. I spoke what he saw. I spoke what the word said. That's why the Bible tells you to renew your mind daily so that you can know the will of God. I had family members, I had family members give me letters and they meant well. And they would say stuff like, Mason will ultimately get his healing when he gets to heaven. God just needed another flower for his garden. God needs another angel up there. Oh, I hate that stuff. Jesus never said that. Jesus never said those things. And when you get letters like that from people who mean well your family, here's the real test. Can you still love them anyway? Can you still believe the best from anyway? I believed God. 
And I started to see small miracles in my son and experience joy, even though the circumstances didn't change. I remember when Mason was, I want to say, seven years old. And uh, by this time, I had gone back to work. I didn't even tell you guys that, which, by the way, when we first found out he was diagnosed, I went from that big contract, and it required me to travel for four months. And I had to pivot in life and walk away from that (laughs) and make less than $40,000 a year working 40 hours a week, driving an hour and a half across my county, sitting in L.A. traffic, working for a boss that hated me that I didn't like very much, working completely below my pay grade, getting underworked, overworked, underpaid, underappreciated, but I stood on the promise. I had to pivot. That was a time in my life where I needed to be a better husband, not a breadwinner for my family. But I stood on a promise. I was going through hell, and I knew that wasn't God's best for my life. I want to tell you something. If you guys are walking through something right now and you know this is not God's best for your life, God gave a desire in your heart and put it there for a reason. You stand on the promise and you start walking towards that vision until it walks out because I promise you he'll bring it to pass. And I remember praying over my son. And at seven years old, we took him in the doctor and things were really bad. And his nose was just packed. They call them, you know, normal people get them. They're called palips. And a lot of people get them in their nose and they go away. But kids with cystic fibrosis, they stay there, and the doctor, who was a Muslim doctor, but I loved her to death because she was the best at CF, and I always said, my God is bigger than her beliefs. I just want the best of the best working on my son. And she's a Muslim doctor, and she said, hey, Mason's going to have to have face surgery on his sinuses to remove the pallops, and there's this chance and that chance and this chance and all that, and we prayed and we prayed and prayed, and it didn't move. But we believed, like, I know that God died, I'm sorry, Jesus died so that those palps didn't have to be there. And I stood on that word. And he goes in for surgery. And as he's going in, they do one final x-ray to, you know, know where they're going to, you know, surgically remove stuff. And she comes out and she says, we don't have to have surgery. She said, I can't explain it, but all the palps are gone. And I remember looking at her, and I have it recorded on my phone. And I said, what happened? And she said, it can only be described as your God healed him. I got a little bit of that. But here's the thing. I still went home and did breathing treatments. I still went home and did the medicine. For those of you who read the Bible, David was anointed king. After he was anointed king, he went back to shoveling sheep's poop. Sometimes you have a promise. Joseph had a promise. We were talking about this the other day. Keep those promises to yourself until God tells you when to tell people, or you might end up in a pit surrounded by a bunch of people that want to kill you. Isn't it crazy how when things start going well for you, when when things are crappy, you know, everyone wants to be a part of the crap train, right? Like, oh, well, how's Bill doing? Well, he's not doing great. Well, you know, and they all get around Bill. But all of a sudden, Bill's got five car dealerships now. Oh, you know, Matt does, uh, you know, the little fat chubby kid that couldn't even run a lap without passing out. Now, all of a sudden, he's doing, a, you know, NFL auctions. Like, they, you get the haters. Like, trust me. Like, bad people don't really want to see you do well. And I'm telling you, when I prayed for my son and I didn't see that thing move and I saw other people get well, my heart stayed steadfast on the promise and on him. Because I knew a secret that I'm going to reveal to you guys. But I'm going to hype it up a little bit. We're going to have some fun. I knew the secret. The secret's in the Bible. Let's go to Paul real quick. Paul knew the secret. In Philippians 4.12, I read 10 and 11. Let's bring up verse 12. This is Philippians 4, verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned what? I've learned the secret of being content. What does content mean? Content means pleased, delighted, and glad. I've learned the secret of being pleased, delighted, and glad. 
in any circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to pray over my sick kid, and I know what it is to go into the doctor and know that he's healed. I know what it is to drive across town working for no money, and I know what it is to do an NFL auction and sign a big contract. I've been here, I've been there. I know what it is to have a depressed wife that don't look real good when you go home, and I know what it is to go to a smoking hot wife that's ready to go, baby. I've been both. Neither one sway me, because I got the secret, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. You and I were having a conversation on the way home, Damon. If I could only get my house, well, if I could only make more money, if I could only get this, I go, then what? Then what? So you got more money, then what? So you got a house, then what? You got a bigger house, then what? Then what? Be content regardless of where you're at. Finding your joy here and all that stuff will come. And even if it doesn't, your life is not your own. Lay down your cross and follow him. Regardless of what's going on, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want, Paul had a secret. What's your secret? Jerry, you lost 50 pounds. You look good. What's your secret? Mama, your face is radiant right now. You look absolutely gorgeous. What's your secret? Man, you've been working out, and I love your hair. What's your secret? Everyone wants to know what the secret is. What's your secret? Papa Pope, you smell good. What's your secret? Bring up that slide of my wife, and I'm going to end with this. It's powerful. This was a post that came up on December 14th, which I believe was two days ago. Is today the 16th? 15th? So this was yesterday. She sent this to me. This was December 14th, 2012. This was right before he went in and had that surgery I just told you about. Here's what the post says, because I know you can't see it. This is my wife. She says, resilient, tough, strong, brave. Just a few words to describe this boy. He's been faced with an uphill climb. Mm. And now at 13 medicines daily for this entire month, and several breathing treatments. Here's the secret. My wife found the secret. But his face and the strength and peace provided by God gives me all I need to keep on keeping on. If you go to Philippians 4.13, Paul knew the secret. A lot of us have it tattooed on us. Some of it has as our Instagram hashtag. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. My wife found the secret. She said, the strength and peace provided by God gives me all I need. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't even have a revelation of Jesus. They just had integrity. And they said, no matter what happens, I ain't going to bow down. I'm going to go into the fire, and we'll see what happens. Everybody might be burning up around me. And the world might be falling apart in quarantine. Everything might be going to hell in a handbasket. But I'm moving forward in integrity. And what happened? When they got in the fire, there was a force fourth man standing there with them. They didn't even know it was Jesus. They wanted what we have. They didn't even know Jesus was standing in the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar said, who's in there with them? It looks like a son of God. It looks like the man of God. And he said, get those boys out of here. And they changed Nebuchadnezzar and the environment around them because they had integrity. How much more integrity and revelation do y'all have now that you have Jesus Christ, the revelation? Come on, this is good preaching right here. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. All things. How many things? That would stink if it said, I could do some things through Christ who strengthens me. Then you would wonder if what you're going through is the sum or the thing. You wouldn't really know. But it doesn't matter what you're going through because you can do all things. Let me show you the Facebook post that she posted yesterday. Oh, snap. Look at my boy today. How many breathing treatments is he on now? Zero. How many medicines does he take now? He's gone from 13 medicines to one medicine. Most people in here take more medicines in one day than he does. And he was born with a rare genetic disease. Doctor said he was going to die and never play football again. And I'm going to coach this boy coming this fall in football. He's got an unbelievable left leg. He's one of the fastest kids on the team. It's just unbelievable if you believe if you believe 
the number one thing the devil's going to try to attack is here. He's trying to get you right here. And whatever is in here came from here and here. What are you looking at? What are you listening to? Which people are you surrounding yourself with that's talking in here? What are you looking at that's going in here? Because what goes in here and here goes in here. And what it's in here goes right here. God speaks to you in your spirit. The devil speaks to you in your mind. What's in between your mind and your spirit? Your heart. There's a war going on for this thing inside of you. Renew your mind daily. You are not called to fight a fight of fear. You are not called to fight a fight of addiction. You are not called to fight a fight of pornography. You are not called to fight a fight of depression. You are not called to fight a fight of cancer, a fight of cystic fibrosis, a fight of loneliness, a fight of questioning your identity, who you are. You're not called to fight that fight. You're called to fight one fight. What is it, Papa? The good fight of faith. You're called to fight one fight, the good fight of faith, and the devil will do whatever he can because he don't fight fair to rob you of your faith. I got one more secret from you. You Bible theologians probably won't like this one because I don't know if y'all heard it before. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to go to Matt. Don't turn there. It's all right. It's, gonna, it's in Matthew 17, 20. It's when Jesus healed the paralytic boy when the disciples couldn't. And if the worship team wants to come up, now would be a good time. It's totally your call. I'll close it either way. But this is powerful because I was always told and I was always preached that when the disciples asked, Master, why couldn't we heal the boy? He said, well, this type only comes out through prayer and fasting. It was always preached to me that it was the demon. This demon only comes out from prayer or fasting. And I started to think like, did Jesus really need to like pray and fast extra hard to get a demon or is he the son of God and he just speaks the word and goes? It's not what the Bible says. Here's what it comes down to, faith. In verse 20, and he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you say to the mountain, move, and it moves from here to there. It will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. He ain't even talking about the demon. He's talking about your faith. Your faith. Your faith in prayer and fasting. Where's your faith? He asked Peter, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see in your life? Are you seeing your circumstances? Where's your faith? We're going to go on a big fast after this, aren't we, Papa? Like, I'm telling y'all, everyone, you can stand right now. Let's stand together. Let's fight the good fight of faith together. God wanted me to come here tonight to ignite y'all's faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. If you can get your faith in the right level, your joy will follow. And if you're living a life of joy and faith, watch your circumstances change. Quit looking at your circumstances. Look at the king of kings and look and stay in the word. Get in the word and watch your faith go through the roof and your faith will heal the sick. Who touched me? It was me. Your faith has made you well. I ask God all the time, why is my son better? I know you, you, who you are. He said, in the midst of hell, your faith stood fast and you didn't live by what you saw, you lived by my word. And when you live by the word, despite of the hell you're going through, things will change. Your life will change. I want every head bowed and every eye closed for one second, then I'll have you all open your eyes. Because as I was praying for you all this morning, and today, God told me that there were three people in this room that were thinking about taking their life. And I want you to raise your hand, and no one's looking at you because I want to pray for you. If you think that suicide is a better option than what you're currently living, raise your hand real quick and put it down. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking for one more. That's two. God told me three. Where are you at? I'll wait. Shut up. 
There it is. Thank you, Jesus. In case I heard incorrectly, is there a fourth? Thank you, Jesus. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I speak life over every person in this room, especially the three that raised their hand, God. I thank you that right now that by your stripes they are healed in Jesus' name. One of them is battling a sickness, and that's why they thought it was better for life to end than to go on living in pain. And I command pain to leave that body right now by the Spirit of the living God. Be healed, be well in Yeshua's name. Thank you, Jesus. I speak life into everybody in this room. God, give them a sign. Bring someone across their path. Just like Nate came across Eli's path today and told him he liked his personality, bring someone across their path and tell them what you like about them. Revive, revive their belief, their faith. And after tonight, let them walk out of this room completely, completely changed. Y'all can raise your, uh, your heads now if you want to. I just want to pray. I never want to preach without giving somebody the opportunity to live with the Jesus that I am talking and preaching about right now. He's the ultimate game changer. He changes everything. If you have not made a decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, please come up here right now and let me pray for you. I know I did not speak a help, fire, and brimstone, and if you died tonight, where are you going to go? But that doesn't matter. If it's you, come up here. Come up here. Let me pray for you. Put Jesus in the driver's seat, or as Carrie Underwood said, Jesus, take the wheel. Is there anybody? Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. It's my job to give the opportunity. Does anybody need healing in their body? Raise your hand to heaven. Raise your hand to heaven, not because you're desperate, but because you have a promise. Raise your hand to heaven and expect heaven to meet you right where you're at right now. Raise your hand to heaven and say as loud as you can, Lord, thank you for healing me because it's your will that I'm well and I can do more through Christ who strengthens me and in this world than not being in this world. Holy Spirit, heal me now for your name's sake. And if you believe that you've been healed, clap your hands like you just got healed. Thank you, Jesus. As you listen and tuned in with us today to hear the word of the Lord, we believe that God is doing something special in your life, that the word of God will not return void. But you know, you may be there today saying, I've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. And you need to do that. Nothing like experiencing the life-changing message of the gospel as Jesus Christ comes into your heart, changes, makes you a whole new person. So today, if you would, if you were willing to have him come into your heart, I'm going to pray with you. So Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, thank you, Lord, you left heaven for us to come and take our sin, our sickness, our disease, all of our shortcomings upon yourself so we could have your life and have it in your abundance. We thank you for that, making us new creatures. So thank you, Lord God, for changing my life and saving me and giving me a home eternal in heaven forever with you. If you prayed that today, God bless you, and you need to know Jesus Christ wants to be Lord and Master of everything and bless you with all heaven has to offer in Jesus' name. We are so thankful that you joined with us today in the Covenant Living Room. We are faith family. We want to invite you, if you're ever around the Douglas, Georgia area, come to our local church. We have a seat safe for you. Until then, we love being part of your online family. We are growing together. Call us, text us, email us, and let us know if we can pray with you about anything. If you'd even like to say, hey, I want to come through, save a seat for us. We want to get to know you better. We look forward to seeing you at Covenant.